Okay, my name is Giuseppe D'Angelo. Thank you very much for being here this afternoon. Uh, this talk, uh, I'd like to introduce you to a few multi-threading concepts, uh, especially involving Qt. Uh, of course, multi-threading is a much bigger and general topic than Qt itself, so in this talk I'd, ri I'd, ri I'd rather like to address what are the Qt-specific topics and peculiarities uh, when you use multi-threading uh, in combination with Qt classes. So, uh, yeah. My talk will look like this. I will introduce you to Qthread, which is one of the central class about uh, threading in Qt. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about synchronization issues, trade safety, and uh, especially if you are up to latest C++ standards, uh, there is a lot going on in the C++ standards when it comes to the threading facilities. C++ 11 introduced some thread, started async. Uh, these threading facilities are being incremented in C++ 17 with the parallel algorithms. There's a lot going on. So I'd like to have a few extra slides at the end about like comparison of what's going on. Uh, okay. Uh, a little word of advice. Uh, I will not have time in this talk to discuss uh, some of the Qt APIs such as Qt Concurrent that deal with like uh, map reduce frameworks inside of Qt. Uh, the reason why I'm not going through this talk is because uh, if you just Google on YouTube, there is an also talk from last year conference just about those topics. So I'd rather focus on these topics instead. Yeah, so this is just the plumbing, the low level. So let's get started and let's get everybody on the same page. Do you all know what a thread is? Because that's going to make my life considerably easier. Okay, you all know? Raise your hands. Yeah, okay, okay, perfect. So you know what a thread is, yep. Perfect. Let, let me start a talk a little bit about how we create and handle threads in Qt. Uh, in Qt, there is a, a class, a central class, which is called Qthread. Uh, that is the class that deals with uh, managing code that runs in another thread. Okay. So if you need to create uh, a new thread, spawn it, and uh, launch it, that's the class you want to use. Qthread itself, from a, tech, from a code point of view, is a QObject subclass. So you cannot copy it. You cannot move it. But since it's also a key object, it's got a few goodies. For instance, it's got signals on top of it that will tell you when a thread starts or when a thread finishes. You can monitor what a thread is doing that way. Uh, the important part about Qthread is that it's really Qthread class itself. It's meant to manage a thread. It represents a thread of execution. It's not itself the thread it manages. Uh, I'm going to explain why in the next few slides. So how do I use Qthread to create a new thread? Uh, in the simplest way possible, uh, what I need to do is subclassing Qthread and re-implementing the run function, right? I'm pretty sure that if you use some other threading library or some other lang programming language, you've done something similar. Uh, you subclass Qthread, implement run. Uh, then you create an instance of that subclass and you call start, not run, of course. You see that? Yeah, good. Uh, why this idea of creating a uh, at instance and then starting it is because you can do some extra work before starting a thread. For instance, you can change its priority, you can give the thread, the new thread a new name or stuff like that. So that's why Qthread gives you the possibility of, let me create a thread first by creating the instance and then I can start to launch it. And so the new instance gets launched with the, all the options set up already. Yep, so let's see some code. The code would look something like this. I got my thread class, which inherits from Qthread and got this uh, override run, and inside of this function, I just put the code that I want to run in the new thread. Yep. Then I create an instance like that. So thread create new uh, new queue, sorry, new my queue thread. Yeah, over there. And then I start it like that. Okay. Once it started, it will do the work. Uh, I can synchronize and wait for it to finish by calling wait on the instance. Okay. So this call here will block the calling thread until the managed thread has finished running. So I, I get the possibility of controlling it. Yep. Uh, if you're familiar with the standard thread API, you may notice that there are some differences in the sense that standard thread uh, does not, you don't subclass it. You just pass it a function to run. Uh, in 510, a function that I have added to Qthread is called Qthread, Qthread create that does more or less the same thing. Uh, in the sense you can pass to it a function to call and the arguments to this function. And this will return a Qthread instance that runs that function in a separate thread. Yep. Uh, however, a likely standard thread, the thread that gets returned by Qthread create is not started yet. You still need to start it manually. And the idea is the same, that you got a possibility of doing some 
additional setup work before starting the new thread. So again, if you want to change its priority before it gets started. Yep. That is, you launch the thread as usual and you wait for it for, to finish. So uh, after I launch a thread, after I start a thread, the thread will naturally stop running when you return from run. And when you return from run, the new thread that you just created will be destroyed by the operating system. Uh, Qthread will offer you a few ways to figure out if the thread that you just launched is still running or is already finished. So it's got these functions such as is running or is finished that you can just ask, is it, is it there yet or not? You can also connect to a few signals, like, a, like the started signal or the finished signal to provide a better notification mechanism for you to know when a certain thread is done running. Yep. From inside the thread, you can also put yourself to sleep. So, okay, wait three seconds. Uh, there are, there's the sleep function and the M sleep functions. Uh, that allow you to sleep. It is generally a very bad idea, TM. You sh you're never supposed to sleep explicitly. If you have something like that in your code, try thinking about why I'm doing this. Perhaps an event-driven design or polling is a much better design. Uh, and as I just told you, you can wait for a Q thread to finish by calling wait on it. Yep. This wait call is actually has got a timeout, so you can specify how long are you willing to wait for a thread to finish. So this is all good. Let's start about the cube-specific problems or cube-specific quirks when using threads. In general, cube comes with a long list of devices that I've tried to sum up in these slides about what you're allowed or not allowed to do in uh, threads that you're going to launch. So in particular, from a non-main thread, you are not allowed at all to perform GUI operations. All GUI operations in Qt must happen in the main thread. Okay, uh, so pretty much using any widget API, using any Qt Quick API, using Pixmaps, using anything that might touch the graphical server is not allowed from a secondary thread. You can only do that from the main thread, right? However, this does not mean using GUI classes in general. So using some GUI classes, it's still fine from secondary thread. For instance, you're allowed to use QImage, QPainter, and these classes, because these classes basically are client side. These are classes that live entirely within your application and they don't go poking your graphical server. Yep, so you are allowed to use those. Uh, OpenGL is a tricky one. Uh, OpenGL may or may be not be supported by your specific platform. So you don't know. You must check at runtime. There is this function there on QOpenGL context that will tell you if it is fine for this particular platform to call OpenGL functions from a separate thread. There are some huge number of reasons why you may want to do OpenGL work from a separate thread, for instance, to upload textures, upload new buffers from separate threads. Whether that's okay or not, you need to check it at runtime. Yep. So this family of things you are not allowed to do. Another thing that you are not allowed to do is call QApplication exec, so to start the main thread event loop from a secondary thread. Yeah, by definition, that doesn't make any sense, right? So you're not, not allowed to do that. Uh, something else that you should not do is ever blocking the GUI thread. So from the main thread, you're not supposed to like wait for secondary thread to finish. You're supposed to call the signals to know when it's finished. Uh, and last but not least, actually, this last point there. When you spawn a separate thread and you create a key object in that separate thread, you must destroy them all before that thread finishes. Okay, you are not allowed to have key objects out leaving the thread that uh, in which they have been created. So how do I do that? Oh, yeah. Uh, yes and no. So let, let me see. Uh, this slide should answer your question. So the, the question was about if we can use delete later. And the second bullet point should answer that question. Yep. So how do I, how do I make sure that all the queue objects that I create in a separate thread get destroyed when the thread uh, finishes? There are basically three different options. The first one is the easiest one. I just create them on the stack inside Qthread run. So by definition, when Qthread run returns, these objects on the stack are going to be destroyed. And then after run returns, the thread finishes. So that's fine. Uh, a second possibility is doing this, is connecting the delete later signal, sorry, the delete later slot on those queue objects to the finished signal of Qthread. And although this may seem strange, because by definition, again, I'm connecting something that says finished to something that says delete later, 
but later when it's already finished. Now this actually works. Yep. Uh, and the third possibility is moving them out of the thread. Uh, I'm going to discuss this in a, a few slides after, but basically uh, key objects know in which thread they've been created. There is a possibility of moving this association so that then you can make them outlive the thread. So more code, let's see this in practice. Uh, this is my thread and inside the run function, I can create a few key objects on the stack like that. That's totally fine because by the time I return from run, these three key objects are going to be destroyed. Okay. I can also use smart pointers such as QScoped pointer or unique pointer of any smart pointer of your choice. So this P object here may get created or may not be created depending on some condition. It doesn't matter. When I return from run, the smart pointer is going to be deleted and that will destroy my object in the end. So that's still fine. Another possibility here is that I create a key object and then I connect the finished signal from QThread to its to that object delete later slot. Yep. So basically when the, before somehow this thread finishes that that object will be destroyed. And the last possibility is I create an object and then just before exiting this thread, I move it out, I push it to another thread. I change the association between that object and the thread that it remembers it was created into to another thread. Uh, the peculiarity of doing so, I will discuss in more detail what this move thread means. Uh, there is, however, a gotcha that basically once I move an object to another thread, this other thread becomes responsible from it. So in this call here, after I do that, I'm not allowed to touch this object any longer. Now there is another thread that manages it. Yep. Okay. So this is enough theory. Uh, let me go a little back about Qthread usage. Uh, in Qt, there are basically two different ways of running code in a separate thread with Qthread. Uh, and you can decide depending on whether you need or need not to have an event loop in that particular thread. So Qt allows you to choice. You can, when you, when you want to spawn a new Qt thread, you can decide whether you need an event loop in there or not. Yeah, an event loop is needed if you need to use timers or networking or any kind of asynchronous operation in that separate thread, right? So Qt gives you the possibility of running event loops in your threads. So how do I use Q, how do I use Qt thread without an event loop? You do exactly what I just told you. You subclass Qt thread, you override run, and you spawn the thread. There are no event loops running in there. Yep. So for instance, here I have got a thread that wants to load some files from disk, do a few calculations and save the results. And I want to do this in a separate thread because I don't want to block the GUI. Okay, straightforward. Uh, however, Qt also allows, uh, allows you to run paired thread event loops. Yep. So the idea is that in your separate threads, you may want to do anything that requires uh, event loops to be running. As I told you, timers, networking, all those sort of stuff. In order to do so, uh, you are basically, you can start event loops in separate threads. The idea is that the thread local event loop will deliver events to the objects that live in a thread. Yeah. So in this case here, this like thread B has got these three key objects and its own event loop is managing the events posted to those three objects. Okay. So how do I do that? The way I do that is very, very similar. I subclass Qthread, inside my run function, I call exec. Okay, the exec function, just like Q application exec, this exec function inside Qthread will run the thread local event loop. Okay, so for instance, if I want to connect a socket, I can create a socket asking to connect, but that call right there, that doesn't connect right away. That just starts the procedures to connecting. You must run and have a loop to get that socket connect to something actually. So you call exec. Yep. And you can do all the processing you want. Then when exec returns, it means that you're done with that thread local event loop and you can return from run and kill your thread. Yep. How do I block exec from running? I can call qthread quit or qthread exit. Quit, uh, the exit allows you to pass a return value from exec if you want to. It's pretty much similar to QCore application exec if you think about that. Uh, another possibility if you want is to get la a little lower level by using another class which is in Qt, which is called QEvent loop. That's another class that allows you to spawn event loops on demand. It works just like this. 
Okay. So, um, excuse me. Uh, there is a nice thing in Qthread, which is this. If you don't subclass Qthread, if you just use plain Qthread and you call start, what is default implementation of run going to do? Well, the default implementation of run is actually just going to call exec right away. Okay, so if I just use a plain Qthread and I start it, what I'm doing is just launching a devil loop on a separate thread. Right? So what can I do with this information? Well, this is, this is useful because I can build uh, event-driven processing in a separate thread without the need of subclassing Qthread. For instance, I can do, I can arrange things in uh, this scheme right here. I can create a Qthread, a plain Qthread, not a my subclass. That's just the stock Qthread. I can create like some sort of worker object that needs to be done, work done in a separate thread. Then if you, I perform a few connections. I connect the started signal from the thread to the do work slot of my worker. So when the thread starts, the worker does some work in the separate thread. Yep. And then I connect the, a signal coming from the worker, for instance, work done or something like that, to the quit slot of Qthread. Okay. So basically now when the thread gets started, the, the worker will do some work. And when it finishes, the work done signal from the worker will cause the, th the thread to quit, right? But of course, I must also not leak this object. So I also perform the connection I told you before. I connect the finished signal from the thread to the lead later slot of the worker. Yeah, there's almost that. Uh, the last thing I need to do is change the association between the object in question and the thread that owns it. As I told you before, so this worker object was created by the current thread, but I don't want that. I want this worker to function in the separate thread. And the way I do so is by moving it to the separate thread. So this move association basically changes the idea of which thread should manage this worker object, right? Now, after this call, the worker object is managed by the thread. So all I need to do now is start the thread and this series of connections will do the rest for me, right? Okay. All right, so that is pretty much a description about how Qthread functions. Let, let me talk a little bit about the second topic, which is synchronization. So pop quits, uh, what is the single most important thing about threads? Come on. <laughs> I mean, so the topic is called synchronization. What is the most single important thing about threads? Synchronization, yes, correct. You must not screw up. You must not do data races, yeah? In particular, any concurrent access to shared resources must not result in a data race. Uh, the C++ language now tells you what a data race is, and a data race is basically some uh, an access to uh, one memory location where at least one of the accesses is a write, and the accesses are not atomic, and no access happens before the other. And the definition of atomic and happens before comes straight from the C++ standard. Yep. So basically this means the two other you deal with atomics or you must synchronize your accesses. There is no other way. Okay. So how do we not screw up? How don't we protect ourselves from data races? Uh, Qt offers you a few classes that help you doing that. So it offers basically a complete set of low level APIs for dealing with synchronization. You got a mutex represented by the class QMutex, which is both recursive and non-recursive. Uh, you got a semaphore, or if you want a counting mutex, a mutex that protects a number of resources, not just one. Uh, I got condition variables. Uh, I got read-write locks or shared mutex, a mutex that can lock any number of times for reading, but only one time for writing. Yep. And also got atomics. If, any, if I want to play with that, I got atomic integers and atomic pointers. Right? I got all the building blocks to protect my resources and do safe multi-threaded programming. Uh, there are also classes, uh, RAI classes for lock management, such as mutex locker, read locker, classes that help me not uh, forget about, oh, I need to unlock the mutex when I return from this function. Yeah, you did, but you forgot, and now you've deadlocked your program. So let's see an example of this. So I got a thread here. Uh, it's a Qthread subclass. 
I want this thread to run forever until the user says stop. So I want to cancel you. So the idea is that the user can call cancel on this thread. A cancel is going to set a boolean to true. Okay. When this thread needs to be canceled. And inside my run function, I call while I'm not canceled, well, keep doing something. Yep. And this is canceled just returns the cancel boolean that I got somewhere inside my class. Actually, it's over there. Does this code smell to you? Why? <laughs> because it's not synchronizing. Yep. So you got, you got a database between this right here and this read right here. Even though this is a bool, booleans are not atomic and therefore you must protect them with a the mutex. So if, so two solution, either I turn this into an atomic or I change and I use a mutex so I can do something like this instead. I add a mutex member variable to my class which needs to be mutable uh, because I need to lock it inside its console. Okay. And now I call console and inside console, I lock the mutex by using one of those uh, classes that allow you to lock a mutex and I change it. And inside is canceled. I also lock the same mutex and I return the function and I return the value. So now I protected myself against the data race. Okay. Does it make sense? All right. Pop quits. Why this m cancel false over here does not need mutex protection? I'm writing into it, but I'm not locking the mutex. Why? Sorry? Sorry, sorry, sorry? Yes, the thread is not running yet. The thread is not even built yet. The thread does not exist until this constructor returns. Right, so I cannot possibly run over it with a data race because there is no such thread before the constructor returns. Correct. Yep. So this is safe. Don't worry about that. Okay. So this is an example of that. Uh, by the way, this very feature is another add-on that Qthread has. So in case you need something for that for your applications, please don't reinvent it. Uh, Qthread has this request interruption function that sets like an interruption flag and inside the run function, you can call, you can poll this is interruption requested to check if somebody wants to stop. Okay. So please don't reinvent it. It's just an, a note. So let me actually uh, go further and let's talk about synchronization and cute classes in particular, which cute classes require synchronization, how, how we do achieve thread safety when playing with the cute classes. So before doing that, uh, a little bit of jargon or technical terms, because multi-threading terms may be different depending on what books you read. Uh, in cute, we use these definitions to express whether something is thread safe or not. We in Qt, at least, we say that uh, a function is thread safe if it's safe for it to be invoked at the same time for mul from multiple threads on the same data without synchronization, okay? Without the need of, for you to do anything at all on it, all right? We say that a function is reentrant if it's safe to be invoked at the same time from multiple threads on different data. That's the difference between thread safe and reentrant. Okay? So I can, the same function can be called on different data that from multiple threads at the same time. That's totally fine. When you actually have that function act on the same data, you must manually synchronize it by adding locks or mutexes or whatever you need. Uh, last, we also got the, another category, which is non reentrant or thread unsafe. This function cannot be invoked from more than one thread at all. This function must be invoked only from one thread. Okay. Uh, we can extend this definition to classes actually. So for classes, these definitions apply to non-static member functions. Yep. In other words, it's as if I consider that this pointer as an argument to those functions when I think about what is the same data, what is different data. It's the object you're invoking those functions upon. Okay. So a few examples. Uh, classes that are thread safe or functions that are thread safe. Well, QMutex, of course, is thread safe. Right? Otherwise, what's the point? Connect is thread safe. Given the same Q object, you're allowed to call connect on it and connect for, to its signals, its slots 
from multiple threads at the same time, you don't need any mutex around it. Uh, post event, uh, a function that allows you to post a new event in the event queue. That's thread safe. You can call that function for multiple threads at the same time. Doesn't matter. Reentrant classes. Uh, queue string is only reentrant. It's not thread safe. What do I mean by that? Well, different threads can use different queue, queue string instances at the same time. That's fine. But no two threads can access the same queue string object. That's not fine anymore. You need to provide synchronization. Okay? So queue string, queue vector, queue image. In general, all value classes in queue are just reentrant, which makes sense. If you think about that, consider all this as you would consider int. It's the same principle. Yep. And last, we got a few classes which are not even reentrant. So queue widget, queue pixmap, queue quick item. Oh, sorry. Those classes are only usable for the main thread. You cannot touch them at all from a secondary thread, which means by definition, these classes are not reentrant. Okay. How do I figure out? How do I know out of the box? Well, if you open the documentation, this is the documentation for QString, there is a note right there. Sorry, on the bottom. I don't know if you can read it from the back, but yeah, there is a note right there that tells you all functions in this class are reentrant. So that's how you know that it's publicly documented. It's an API contract. Okay, we cannot express it in any other better way than documenting it that way. Uh, and there is a, a big gotcha there. If you don't read this sentence, you must assume the class is not reentrant. So you must always assume the worst unless the documentation tells you this class, this function is reentrant or thread safe. Okay? So what about key object? What about the most important class in Qt? <laughs> Is it reentrant? Is it thread safe? Is it non reentrant? Well, the documentation says that it's uh, reentrant, but there is actually a very important thing to say that key object itself is thread aware. Any given key object knows which thread owns it somehow. It knows in which thread it's being created into. And you can ask the key object, what is the thread that owns you by calling key object thread, by calling that thread member function on it. So we say that basically the object lives in that particular thread or has affinity with that particular thread. Okay. We can change this affinity at any time by calling move to thread. So I can take a, I can take a key object and say, no, now you belong to this other thread. All right. So key object has this idea of which thread lives in, which makes it slightly not slightly weird if you want. So if I open the key object documentation, I will read in there that key object is reentrant, except for a huge number of cases in which it's non reentrant. And I hate that definition, by the way. So the documentation says this, that uh, key object is reentrant, except if you're using event based classes, such as queue timer, queue TCP socket, all of those are non reentrant. Uh, given a, a key object, the event dispatching for that key object happens in the thread it has affinity with. And this means that if you're manipulating a, an object from one thread, which is not that object's thread, that object's thread might be posting event to that, to that object. So now we got a possible data race inside your key object coming from the events that the event queue is being uh, dispatching towards it. All the key objects in the same parent child tree must have the same Q thread affinity. Okay. You are not allowed to have a chain of threads that uh, a chain of objects that live to in different threads. Right. Notably, for instance, when you, when I create a key object in a secondary thread, I cannot parent it to the Q thread object itself. Why? Because this Q thread object lives in one thread and the object you created is living in another thread, the new one. So you cannot perform that chain, right? Lastly, the one, that, the thing that we just discussed, you must delete all the key objects leaving a certain queue thread before destroying it. Actually, no, that was not even the last. The last one is move to thread. The function that changes the affinity is non reentrant You must call this from the thread the key object lives in. So many gotchas, so many corner cases. Ignore the documentation. <laughs> it's easier to think of a queue object as non-reentrant. Period. 
you can only touch key objects from the thread it has affinity with. You can change this affinity if you need to, but you can only touch it from one thread. That's much, much easier to reason about and to live with. Okay? So this is nice, but this also opens a problem. If I got a key object into another thread and I cannot touch it, how can I tell it to do some work? How can I communicate with that key object leaving another thread? Well, Qt has a solution for that. Uh, that solution goes under the name of cross-thread or queued signals as lots. Yeah, it's a very nice solution, very elegant solution. What this solution works looks like is this. Uh, you can emit a signal from one thread and have the slot invoked from another thread. Okay, but this thread is not just one random thread. It's exactly the thread that the receiver object is living in. So it's the right thread by definition. Yeah, this, avoid, this avoids you to have touching the key object from the wrong thread. You just keep communicating, communicating with it by using cross-thread signal slots. Uh, so under the hood, the thing works like this, is that when you emit a signal, anytime, Qt does a check for you and checks if the receiver object is living into a different thread. If the receiver, if the receiving object is living in a different thread, the connection will be queued. Uh, what happens under the hood is that an event gets posted for that object into its thread affinity, right? And that, that thread dispatches the event by calling the slot. Right. Yep. And since it's the right thread, this by definition is, is safe. However, this requires that, of course, the receiver object is living in a thread with a running event loop. Otherwise, this meta call event will never be dispatched. So this works as long as you got an event loop running in, into the receiver thread. And there is a small caveat about that you must register met the arguments that you pass, but don't worry about this because if you forget about that call, you get warnings on the console and you know that you, the warning says, please call QRegister meta type. So you know that you need to do that. Yep. Uh, so this decision is mostly automatic, but if you want, there is a fifth argument to connect that you can specify to force any connection to be queued, even within the same thread. So let's see all of this in action. Over here, what I've got is a queue thread. Yep. Uh, when I build this queue thread, I store a pointer to a producer object. And inside the thread, I got a consumer object. What I do inside this thread is connecting the producer signal called something has been produced to the consumer slot okay, consume this particular element. And then I start the thread local event loop so that this signal actually works. All right. In the main thread, what I can do is that I created my producer, I created the thread instance, and I start a new thread. Okay. And then I tell the producer, please start producing stuff. Okay. So what happens when the producer fires a signal telling, okay, I've got some work to be done, that this connection will invoke consume on the consumer from the right thread, because consumer is living in the new thread because it's been created in the new thread. So this works automatically, magically. And I did not need to write one single lock or mutex or queue, which is synchronized. It just works. Yeah, it's a very, very nice and elegant solution. This code has a bug, however, can you see it? It's, yeah, it's a very small and tricky one, but it's there. Sorry? Yeah. So, uh, okay, other question. Is this call safe? This call, is this call safe? Because this call is touching producer and producer is an object not living in the current thread. Well, answer yes, this call is safe because connect is thread safe. So I, I can't know, I'm, it's fine. I don't need to worry about that. So that's okay. Now this code has another bug, which is I might start production even before the consumer gets created. Because at this point in time, when I call start, there is no guarantee where I am inside this function. So the producer may start producing a few elements that don't get consumed because the consumer does not exist or the connection did not happen, right? So. A better way of doing this is not creating the consumer into the thread because I don't know when that's done. 
I can just switch and uh, to a much better design, which looks like this. I create the producer. I create the consumer. So now they both exist. That's fine. I create a plain Q-thread without subclassing. Okay. I connect the producer and the consumer together like that, just like before. Yep. And I connect the finished signal from the thread to the delete later slot of the consumer. So when the thread is gone, the consumer is also gone. And I simply move the consumer to the other thread. Right? That does exactly what I was doing before without the bug. So now I can start the thread and I can start my production of elements. And this would work because the consumer is now leaving in, in the secondary thread. Right? So the consume slot will be invoked in the secondary thread. <laughs> yep. Again, not, not one line of locks and mutexes and weird stuff. Yeah. Um, is there a when the connect yeah. the Microphone. Or can you wait later for questions? Uh, it's the same. It's specific to this line of code. Yeah. Um, this is auto connection. When is the connection type evaluated? During connect or during the send of the signal? Take a guess. Take a guess. This work, this code works. So it must, so the question is about this connection happens here and there is a decision that must be taken about the kind of connection, if it's direct or if it's queued, right? So when I do this connect, everything is in the same thread. So this connection is direct. No. The, the decision happens at signal emission time. Every time I meet a signal, I go look for the receiver, check if it's in the same thread. If it's in the same thread, then the invocation is direct. If it's in the, another thread, then the invocation is queued. It happens every single time you emit a signal. Okay? All right. Okay, does it make sense? All right. So another example of this queued invocation in place is looks like this. I got my thread here. Yep. Inside run, I emit a signal. Okay, so this signal gets emitted by a separate thread. And in my main thread, I, I do something like that. So I connect this signal to a receiver. Yep, and I start it. And this actually answers your question because this actually works. It is perfect. This code works perfectly because this signal is emitted from a secondary thread, but the slot, the receiver, leaves in the main thread. So the decision about when the, which kind of invocation this should be is done when this signal is emitted. Okay. So this slot here gets invoked in the right thread. Okay. Yet another example. I got a thread here. Inside my run, I create a socket. I connect the socket, connected signal here to this unconnected. And I tell the socket, okay, connect to something and launch the event loop. And inside this unconnected, I print the data that I received from the socket. Right? So just a variation of the same before. No, this actually doesn't work. You cannot do this. Why? In which slot, in which thread is this slot going to be invoked? This slot is going to be invoked in the thread your my thread class has affinity with. Yeah, which is typically, which is not the thread this class is running. Right? So QThread itself is a Q object. So when you create such a, a class, that instance has a thread affinity which is not the, the thread which is representing. It's the thread that created this instance. Okay, it's one thread before it. If I connect this socket to this, and this and to a slot on this, this slot here is getting invoked on the thread that the instance lives in, and that means I cannot touch M socket from that thread. That's now the wrong thread to touch M socket from. So this is a very, very, a common mistake when playing with Q-threads because people just add slots to Q-thread without realizing that these connections now are going to be queued and now I'm going to evoke these slots from the wrong thread. Uh, I haven't found a way to prevent this from happening in the sense that yes, you are technically allowed to do this, 
But the recommendation I can give it to you is do not add slots to queue threads. Uh, it's a code smell. It's something that when I see that, I start thinking about, did the author of this class really think this through or did he fall into one of these traps? It's extremely common. It's extremely easy to fall into this trap. All right. Okay. Uh, how much more minutes have I got? Yeah. 10. Okay, fine. So uh, let me discuss very, very briefly uh, about uh, the standard library threading facility versus Qt's threading facility. Uh, there is a huge overlap these days because the C++ language and standard library are pushing forward more and more thread classes, so thread aware classes uh, into the core language itself. Uh, so which one should I pick? Should I use Qt? Should I use Q uh, standard thread? So the good news is this, is that uh, you can perfectly mix and match the two. Okay, so you can create you can mix inside the same application, inside the same code, cute thread classes and standard thread classes, and they will just work. Yep. Uh, so that's, that's very, very good for you. Uh, you can use a library that's using standard threads mixed inside your cute application. That's just working as perfectly. Uh, the thing is this, that uh, uh, the standard library is moving, moving extremely, extremely fast. Okay, there is a new standard coming every three years now. And every time we got a bunch of new features that unlock more and more multi-threading potential. So Qt is not catching up. Qt will not catch up. And Qt should not catch up. It's pointless. It's a, a lost battle. We got a community which is a hundred times bigger than ours, pushing more features in there. So there is very, very little we can do. In particular, there is, uh, so parallel algorithms are already coming in 17. There are discussions going on for 20 about continuations, latches, barriers, atomic smart pointers, executors, concurrent queues, distributed counters, coroutines, and these are just the papers I could find the other day that are being discussed. Yep. So there is m so much more coming. Qt will not possibly reimplement this stuff. Okay. So it's good. It's good if you start thinking about what Qt does not provide. I can pick the stuff from the standard library and use it. It will just work. Okay. Uh, there is an important thing. That is, more and more tooling will start checking for the correct usage of standard library APIs, but not Qt ones. Unless we implement Qt classes on top of standard library classes, uh, there will be tooling that will tell you you are doing a deadlock when you're deadlocking a standard mutex. There is no such tool that will tell you you're deadlocking a Qmutex. Yeah, because the tooling gets built with the idea of checking for standard library classes. Uh, so I've done here a small comparison of the APIs between the Qt classes and the standard library classes. Uh, in general, my advice would be start thinking about moving towards the standard library classes, unless you need a queue thread because you want to run an event loop. Since event loops are basically a Qt own thing, then of course queue thread supports them and that's much more convenient to use. But unless you have you are in this use case, start thinking about using the some library classes, not cute ones. So a very brief comparison of the features of the functionalities that you get from QThread and standard thread. Uh, both allow you first to use them without subclassing. Yeah. But standard thread is much better when it comes to basically be a one shot function runner. You can just create one and you detach it and you're done. Yep, when you, so you can call standard thread, pass the function to run, that starts a new thread, you call detach, done. Okay, QThread does not allow you to do exactly this. You need to do some workarounds. So you create a thread, you start it, and you like need to kill, you need to clean up the QThread distance somehow, right? Uh, QThread has this interruption request thing that some threads does not have. This is useful sometimes, but it's trivial to emulate. So. I will not even say it's a con of some thread. Yeah. Uh, some other things here and there, uh, queue thread as support final loops, standard thread as not. However, in, into a standard thread, I can create a queue event loop, which is the class I mentioned before. Oh, sorry. To spawn an event loop in that thread. And that works just as before. Apart from these, the features are equal. Uh, you can create queue objects from a queue thread, create a thread or standard thread, create a thread. You can move objects to these threads, either directly because you've got a queue thread, or if you use a standard thread, you can use this small trick of calling queue thread current thread, 
and that returns a Qtread star. That returns a pointer that you can use to move objects to there. Yep. And in both cases, you can use signals as slots. They just work. So there's nothing to be worried about. Uh, what about synchronization primitives? Uh, in Qt, uh, we got a Qmutex. In the standard library, we got many more kind of mutexes because uh, they decided to implement each kind with a different class, depending on how much you are willing to pay. Because on certain implementations, a recursive mutex is more expensive than a plain mutex. So if you don't need the recursive functionality, you just use a different class and you pay less. Yep. But the functionality is the same. So you got all these four are inside Qmutex and you can use them. For some reason, there isn't yet a semaphore in the standard library. I have not fully understood why. If you really need accounting mutex, well, use QSemaphore or, or invent your own. Oh, sorry again. Uh, there are now in 17 shared mutexes and shared timed mutexes. So that's basically a lock that you can lock many, many times in a shared mode, but only once in exclusive mode. That's the definition of locking multiple times in read mode and only once in write mode, which is the one that Qt uses. Uh, there's Qwait condition and condition variable. They do the same thing. The standard has got this thing called call once, which is a very fancy way of calling a function exactly once. Uh, Qt does not have that. And inside of Qt, we got that Q global static, which is a way of creating uh, a variable and initializing it in a thread safe way only once without failing into global static initialization fiascos and similar things. The standard library has nothing like that because it does not need to. In C++11, if you create a static variable inside a function, that static variable is initialized exactly once in a multi-threaded safe way, so it doesn't need to add language features. It's already there, it's by definition. Yep. So yeah, so these are a few points. I'm out of time. Two minutes, but, but two minutes including questions or excluding questions? Of talk, okay, okay. So I can keep, so this is pretty much what I just told you. Uh, the lock management classes are pretty much similar. Oh, sorry, I forgot here to add the scoped lock, which is the new one coming in C++17. Uh, in the Sun library, we also got, sorry, a unique lock, which is a lock that you can move. So for instance, I can return the locker class from a function, which is something I cannot do from Qt classes. And there is also something very interesting, which is the lock algorithm, standard lock, which is not a, which is not a class, it's an algorithm. Uh, it's a, a fancy algorithm that allows you to lock a number of mutexes in a deadlock free way. So if you need to lock more than one mutex, you should know that you're, you become deadlock prone unless everybody agrees to lock them in the same order. That's what the algorithm does. You don't need to think about the order. You just pass a bunch of mutexes into standard lock and it will always lock them in the same order. Yep. So it's pretty much that. Uh, in terms of atomics, in Q2 we got a few atomic classes, basic atomic integer, atomic integer, etc. In the standard library, we just got one class, standard atomic T. Yep. As something more fancy that we got in the standard library are um, non-member atomic operations. So if you need to write a generic code, you can use the non-member functions because they work on anything which has an atomic API, not just a specific class. Yep. And actually in Qt itself, Qt uses this, this plus plus atomics under the hood, which is a very good news because it means we stop implementing them um, and that's fine. Uh, however, the standard atomics are still offer more features than Qt atomics. So if you're really into atomics programming, move away from the Qt ones, you don't need them anymore. Yep. Okay, a really, really last, last slide. Both in Qt and the standard library, we got thread local variables. They just use a different syntax. In Qt, we use something called Qt thread storage. In the standard library, we use thread local, which is a keyword that you apply to a variable. That's it. Okay, so thank you very much. I got a few minutes for questions, I guess. Yeah, it's coming right now. Thank you for the interesting presentation paper. Is there one or two sh short questions? Or one long one? Oh, oh yeah, or one long one. <laughs> um, it's uh, maybe more a general question. Uh, you said uh, the, the bool is not an atomic. Can you explain uh, 
where that is? Okay, um, so I, I think you were referring to some slide a long time ago. Sorry, let yes. me quickly jump to it. Uh, I think was this slide here, I guess. Was it, was it here? Yeah. It like, okay, yes. So um, there are two things here. One is the language says that uh, concurrent access on non-atomics is a data race. So that's a definition by the standard. The standard says that only atomic classes are safe to do that. Okay, so I can just tell this is the language lawyer point of view. The language says this is undefined behavior. End of the story, there's nothing else to discuss. In practice, why is this actually bad? Um, even though on most architectures, setting a Boolean and reading from it is atomic because the hardware instruction is itself atomic, yep, that's not enough. For instance, the CPU running the run thread, sorry, may never decide to fetch the cache lines from other CPUs because there is nothing in here that says I need to refetch cache. When you write this, there is nothing that says the CPU that runs this code needs to flush its cache line and commit that variable into other CPU's memory. There is nothing, okay? From an architectural point of view, and actually it's good there is nothing because you don't want to unnecessary clash flush caches across processors. Okay, so basically this code right here can run forever without ever noticing that you set the Boolean to true. Because that particular CPU may never see the modified memory. Okay, so from a, so there are, so the answer is goes on these two levels. From a, from a language point of view, that's undefined behavior and that's the end of it. From a hardware point of view, this still doesn't work. Yes. So uh, when you use atomics, in theory, the idea is that uh, uh, you add the, the assembly gets annotated in a special way that says not only this store must be atomic, so it cannot be mixed with any other store, but please also notify everybody else that this particular memory location has been modified. That's the hardware engineer point of view. Okay, so. <laughs> All right. So that was a short question, but a long answer. So I would say we wrap it up. Uh, I'm sure Sorry? the paper will be available for more questions uh, outside of this room. So there's a coffee yes. break now. So uh, at four o'clock <laughs> we have the next session in this room about uh, Fluid Qt Quick application with uh, pointer handlers for fluid applications in Qt Quick. So, okay. thank you for being here. Thank you.